hello and welcome to Simon TV. The NZ Herald newspaper considers itself the organ of record in New Zealand, but last week refused to run paid advertising in favour of democracy. The advertisement was placed by Hobson's Pledge, an organisation dedicated to the principle uh, uh, of, um, of equality in democracy. The principal representative of Hobson's Pledge is, is Dr. Don Brash. Dr. Brash holds a Master's in Economics from the University of Canterbury and a Doctorate from the National Australian University. He commenced his career at the World Bank and, and rose to become go Governor of uh, New Zealand's Reserve Bank. He, he shifted to politics, leading both the National and ACT parties. Widely regarded as the most erudite and affable person in New Zealand public life, uh, certainly by me. He, he joins me now to discuss the situation with the New Zealand Herald. Uh, welcome to Simon TV, Dr. Brash. Can you tell us uh, what happened with the New Zealand Herald last week? I think it's called a false front ad, where you have the full front page of the paper and the next page, which would be page two. Uh, and we ran an ad which said, uh, the government should reclaim the foreshore and seabed for crown ownership, for the ownership of, of the whole public, if you like. And we explained why customer marine titles, which had been uh, provided for in, in an act passed by the national government in 2011, really threatened the rights of other New Zealanders to have full access to uh, the beaches and the foreshore. And uh, we were pleased that they ran that, that double page ad. But uh, shortly after we had run that, a number of people, particularly Maori groups, Maori Journalists Association, and so on, um, said, look, this is factually wrong. The, the public uh, has never owned the foreshore and seabed. And uh, Brash's claim, or Hobson's Pledge's claim about uh, what the customary marine titles would, customary marine titles would give to the tribes which secured those rights is simply factually wrong. So we decided to try and run another full page ad the following week, the 14th of August, uh, explaining where we had got the information from for making these claims. And the information, in fact, was directly from a, a government website. And we provided the QR codes to enable people to check that out for themselves. We thought that was a pretty uh, satisfactory way of answering critics. But uh, the Herald decided, for better or worse, in our judgment for worse, that this was too much and they would not run the ad. It appears that they received a great deal of negative feedback from uh, particularly uh, tribal groups, Maori tribal groups, and they, they ran for cover. They, they took fright, if you like. Uh, and declined to run that the second ad on the 14th of August. So that's where we are now. Uh, we've tried to make that. Sorry. I, 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 I understand completely. And, and, and that certainly raises some disconcerting issues. The, the first question I have for you is, is, is this about the, the NZ Herald's decision making. The word that I've heard from inside the Herald is that they did indeed, as you say, receive a great deal of pressure. Uh, from vested uh, interests within the Maori community. But there was also internal pressure, as they often face, uh, from younger journalists inside the organisation who tend to hold fairly uh, left-wing views. And from an editorial perspective, uh, the Herald is often, uh, the, the, at that level, they feel that they are being somewhat dictated to by their journalists. But my perception of this matter is that the decision to not run uh, the response advertisement on behalf of Hobson's Pledge came from further up the chain. Has there been any communication at all between Hobson's Pledge and the decision makers at executive and board level? Not to my knowledge. Uh, to be honest, uh, some of the communication was handled by our advertising agency, if you like, uh, but we've heard no uh, word directly or indirectly that there was any kind of explanation from the Herald. 
But I think you're right. What we've heard too is that it's not only uh, Maori groups outside uh, the Herald, but also staff within the Herald who were very unhappy about the ad. And I guess that what that reflects is that over the last uh, 10, 20, even 30 years, there's been a consistent attempt to indoctrinate uh, younger people going through the school system, going through the university system, about what the Treaty of Waitangi meant to this new generation of, of Maori activists. I mean, for 140, 150 years after the Treaty of Waitangi was signed, the widespread consensus was that the treaty provided for every New Zealander to have equal political rights, so that we all have the same voting rights and so on. Uh, clearly, there have been exceptions to that. The creation of separate Maori electorates was one. But by and large, the assumption was that the treaty provided for equal citizenship uh, for all New Zealanders. Now, since uh, the late 80s, 1980s, uh, there's been a gradual, gradual attempt to uh, wean younger New Zealanders off that interpretation to an understanding of the treaty, which is that, no, it didn't create equal citizenship. On the contrary, it created a partnership between those with a Maori ancestor and those without a Maori ancestor. Uh, and that's a quite a different constitutional framework. And it's that... Uh, generation of New Zealanders brought up in that kind of indoctrination, which is a headache now. For most New Zealanders, we are all equal. And I find that overwhelmingly, uh, most New Zealanders who speak to me, not everyone does, of course, but overwhelmingly, those who speak to me tend to be uh, from about age 35 up, strongly agreeing. Those under 35 often have been indoctrinated with this uh, constitutional view, as I say, that the Maori are somehow distinct. And when I say Maori, again, I mean anyone with a Maori ancestor. You can be uh, classify yourself as Maori if you have any degree of Maori ancestry, which, of course, is something of a nonsense. I have a friend who has 32 great, great, great grandparents, uh, one of whom was Maori, uh, of the, th the 32, I think, great, great, great grandparents of, of those one is Maori, the other 31 all come from some as some part of the United Kingdom or Ireland. Uh, but he is technically entitled to qualify as Maori in the New Zealand context, which is quite frankly a nonsense. You raise uh, uh, um, a very reasonable concern about the indoctrination that has gone on inside uh, um, New Zealand's education system. And it is, it is the case that in uh, New Zealand's public discourse, we're perhaps the only Western democracy where uh, uh, inherent, inherently racist tyranny of the majority is considered an, a, a reasonable criticism of democracy. And the principle that I think that uh, you outlined for us there is one that is not at all contentious. Uh, gens una sumus, as, as the Latin goes. We are all one people, but there does seem to be a concerted effort uh, against that um, uh, throughout the education system. And we see particular catch terms being used repeatedly. We see it done uh, uh, by, by teachers in schools, but we also see it done by left-wing politicians in our parliament, repeating these catchphrases ad nauseum uh, until they become factoids. An example of this would be partnership or reinterpretation, reinterpreting uh, treaty articles of equality to mean equity. What strikes me throughout this debate is that the Enlightenment principles of logic and reason and critical thinking, epitomized by the approach to the matter of people such as yourself and significantly representatives of the ACT Party, uh, maybe doesn't really resonate with that younger generation who are much more inclined towards the thought-stopping principles of this sort of propaganda that they've been brought up with. What do you think? Well, I think that's absolutely accurate. Uh, and of course, it's not entirely a Maori versus the rest issue, because there are lots of Maori New Zealanders who are fully in accord with, with the views which Hobson's Pledge expresses. For example, uh, my co-spokesperson, 
for most of the time since we were formed in 2016, was herself Maori from the Napoi tribe. She's now in cabinet uh, as a New Zealand first minister of the crown. Uh, my current co-spokesperson is a guy called Elliot Ikale, whose parentage is partly Maori, part Pacific Islander, and partly European. And his wife is Chinese. And as he says, my children represent a, a wide range of ethnicities, Maori, Pacific Islander, European, and Chinese. And I want them to be treated equally. No preference, equally. So there are many, many Maori who, who see the world in, in the same way exactly that, that uh, uh, you and I do. I mean, in the cabinet currently, uh, 20 ministers in cabinet, seven of them are Maori, 35% uh, of the total, in other words. Um, three uh, act, I'm sorry, two act members of parliament, three New Zealand first uh, Maori uh, cabinet ministers, and two national. Uh, six of them, incidentally, are Napoli. Uh, one is, is not. Um, so it is simply not true to suggest that all Maori are, are on one side of this debate and everybody else is on the other. There are many Maori who agree strongly. And ironically, you mentioned the ACT Party is led by a guy who is entitled to be on the Maori role, David Seymour. Um, yeah. I, th I think that's a very good point, Dr. Brash, that uh, that many of the loudest voices are not at all representative of um, of mainstream views within Maoridom. Certainly, uh, my my Maori friends that that I speak with uh, do consider that there are issues to do with Maoridom, as I think we all do, and uh, issues to do with um, with uh, some fairly poor social statistics and efforts ought to be made to address those. But those should not supersede. Uh, an underlying commitment to democracy. But speaking about some of the, the loudest voices within Maoridom, the, the letter from the 170 quote unquote uh, legal and I guess Maori academics um, condemning the original advertisement from Hobson's pledge received significant media coverage. But I, I did notice that um, that you wrote a response eviscerating the primitive arguments that were put forward to get by uh, by those 170 signatories in the letter that it um that they signed however i didn't see any coverage in the media whatsoever to your response certainly nowhere near as much coverage as uh that original letter uh, uh generated in the media is 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 that the case or was there some sort of media no, that, coverage we didn't see any uh, media response to uh, critique of the of the critics, if you like. Uh, as I say, we had hoped to run an ad responding to those critics, and that was that was vetoed uh, by the Herald. Uh, we did put out our uh, negative view of those criticisms in a in an email to our supporters. Uh, they exceed a hundred thousand uh, individuals, but uh, no media coverage of that response was was. Negligible or nil. Well, well that's certainly, uh, that has chilling ramifications for our democracy, where what is reasoned and rational debate receives zero coverage or very little in the media or is portrayed negatively, whereas the extremist separatist views receive almost wall-to-wall -wall coverage in the vestigial media. And I, I suspect that this is what we can expect coming up to November when ACT's Treaty um, Principles Bill is due to be presented to Parliament, uh, I think we will see a lot of negative bias coverage from the vestigial media, and a lot of it will be personal attacks, as we have, we have come to expect. What do you think is, is, when it comes to considering that Treaty Principles Bill, it seems to me that you that we have um, we have the ACT Party and probably New Zealand First representing the majority uh, will of the people that we are all equal and we live in a liberal democracy and on the other side of the argument we have uh, the far left extremists uh, the the ethno nationalist separatists 
represented by the Maori Party, the Green Party and the Labour Party. But I think a significant question for New Zealand is whether or not the National Party can be cajoled and persuaded to represent the will of the people when it comes to that Treaty Principles Bill, or whether they will instead side uh, with those voices on the left. What do you think? I think that's a serious danger. Uh, Mr Luxon has been very careful to avoid taking a strong position on this. In fact, on the contrary, he said to David Seymour, we will not support your Treaty Principles Bill beyond the um, first reading of the legislation. Now, of course, if it doesn't get beyond that, it doesn't get passed. And uh, I think he's been most regrettably weak on that issue. Uh, yeah, I mean, you referred this uh, this debate as being between uh, left wing and right. Not entirely correct description. I mean, a guy like Chris Trotter, for example, would call himself uh, to the left or centre, I think. But on this issue, he's he's uh, about the same place I am, I think. He said uh, a number of times, uh, if there's anything worse, uh, that there's, what is worse than the, the uh, dictatorship of the majority is the dictatorship of the minority. And and uh, so he's totally on side on this issue. And as I say, he would regard himself as being on the left of politics. I'd, I'd certainly take your point. And, uh, and I have a great deal of respect for Mr. Trotter. I find that uh, his political commentary is always uh, uh, worthwhile reading. And, and, and I would agree that he would consider himself to be a leftist, leftist uh, in, in ideological outlook. But I don't think that the left considers him to be one of them anymore. And the, the distinction there is that he's an old school, in my estimation, uh, uh, materialist based, who bases his left-wing ideology um, on, on uh, an analysis of uh, economics as opposed to the current iteration of the left, which is much more concerned with um, social policy and particularly wokeism. What do you think? Oh, I agree with that completely. Uh, Chris has been a, a long-standing friend of mine, despite the fact that our politics are quite different in many respects. But on this one issue, we are absolutely seeing eye to eye. Well, I, I think most sensible people are, but it, it really does strike me as ridiculous that this is in any way uh, contentious, in any way an argument in our society, that we really are having to defend fundamental constitutional principles of democracy uh, against what are, in my estimation, um, some, some very extreme uh, ideological uh, um, attacks against it. Uh, but in, in that regard, what's next for Hobson's pledge? Coming up to November, is, is there going to be, are we going to hear more in this debate uh, from your perspective? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're committed to this uh, and have been so since we began in a very small way in 2016. As I say, the Marine Coast Area Act and the whole, whole foreshore and seabed issue is on us right now. But another issue which is, uh, is very important at this very moment, over the next two or three weeks anyway, uh, is the question of what local, local councils do with Maori wards. Uh, some 45 councils have decided either ever either created Maori wards in the last uh, two or three years since the Labour government changed the law, preventing ratepayers having a say on the matter, or have decided to create them in the future. And uh, between now and the 6th of September, councils can decide to rescind the decision to create a Maori ward or to scrap a Maori, an existing Murray ward, or to face the need to have a referendum on the issue at the time of the local body elections next year. Now, as I say, they've got this very short window, expires on the 6th of September. That's the way the law was, was worded. And councils, I think, should be under pressure from ratepayers to rescind the decision to create a Murray ward where they know perfectly well that if a referendum is held, Maori wards will be thrown out. I mean, a number of Maori wards were uh, proposed by councils prior to the Labour government 
uh, preventing ratepayers expressing a view. And in every case where a referendum on Maori wards was held, it was defeated with one exception. That was Wairoa, which did vote for Maori wards in a referendum. But every other case, uh, uh, ratepayers voted overwhelmingly against them. And councils know perfectly well that if they have a referendum next year, they will be thrown out again. So uh, councils have been, been uh, quite mischievous in creating these wards, knowing that their ratepayers do not want separation on the basis of race in the local government. Yes, and that is that is really interesting because the the argument that the councils and the councillors make is that in a representative de democracy, they are elected by the people to make these decisions. But of course, the, the argument against that is that uh, when it comes to constitutional matters, uh, at a national level and at local level, uh, that should be the unwritten rule has been uh, decided uh, by by uh, going to the people and the resistance to that from the councillors is a damning indictment of their uh, commitment to what are basic principles of the way things are supposed to work in a democracy. Why is it, do, do you think, that it doesn't seem to matter uh, which councillors support this and, and, and which don't? It is just not covered in the media. Nor, for instance, is the fact that those very few councillors who are interested in representing um, the will of the people are bullied and intimidated. Apparently, we've even had a councillor shot at, uh, well, at least his vehicle shot at with a firearm uh, in response to his support um, for plebiscite. Do you think that, that, that those matters are worthwhile being um, being reported in our media? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it's shameful that they're not reported. Um, and that councils are intimidated is, I think, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Um, my partner, by chance, is a councillor uh, in the Western Bay District Council. And uh, she tells me that last time this matter was considered in, in the, by the council in public forum, there were a large number of, of Maori who were strongly in favour of Maori wards uh, took part in, uh, didn't, sorry, didn't take part in the debate, they can't do that, but, but uh, were present. And uh, I gather that's quite an intimidating for many councillors. Yes, well, and, and one would think that uh, our elected representatives going about their duties um, should be able to do so uh, without any sort of intimidation and that the authorities, including the police and the establishment in the form of the media, would would raise more concerns about this but it almost seems to me that because uh the 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 establishment in general is largely supportive of that ideology that they're prepared to look the other way and it's i think it's really important that there are voices pointing out like hobson pledge hobson's pledge does that this is not the way a democracy is supposed to work Yes, that, that's absolutely correct. And uh, uh, I, I'm sure a lot of people actually share that view. I'm constantly uh, surprised at how many people come up to me uh, in public uh, public environment and, and say sort of quietly, almost under the, under the uh, with a, you know, shielding their mouths so they can't be seen what they're saying. Uh, we agree with you. We support you. Uh, so there's quite a substantial body of New Zealanders who do support this, but they feel intimidated to say so. All right. Well, that is that is not the New Zealand that any of us want to live in. Uh, well, I think that, um, that 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 uh, on this matter, you do enjoy a great deal of uh, support, and it's um, disappointing that some of that might be from the silent majority, who are to a large degree by the media having their voices suppressed. So um, before we wrap up, Dr. Brash, uh, what can we expect to see next from Hobson's Pledge? And is there anything you'd like to tell us uh, before we conclude? Well, I think the key thing we'll be, cam be campaigning on in the next couple of months is almost certainly the Treaty Principles Bill, which you referred to earlier. Uh, 
it's disappointing indeed that the National Party has said they will not support it beyond the first reading in Parliament. Um, one of our responsibilities is to make sure the public pressure on the government uh, gets Mr Luxon to change his mind. Because if he does not change his mind, and if that bill does not proceed beyond the first reading, it's important that the public at large get together, organise a citizens initiated referendum, even if it's not an official one. Now, that's suboptimal because a citizens initiated referendum does not bind the government. But it would be a very powerful signal if National, having failed in its responsibility to put that bill through Parliament, and they should do, their constitution, after all, refers to equal citizenship as one of their core values. If they fail to deliver on that, then it's important that the public put as much pressure uh, against them for that failure. I, I certainly agree. I think that it is going to require a great deal of, um, of public pressure to convince this version of the National Party, which is so very centrist and so very steady as she goes beige, uh, to represent the will of the people and to to support a fundamental principle of democracy. So best wishes to you, Dr. Brash, uh, in in your efforts uh, to to convince them to do just that. Uh, and on that note, I will say thank you very much for your time. I very am, I'm very very grateful to have had this opportunity to speak with you, and I'll look forward to uh, celebrating your successes. Uh, in the days ahead. Thank you, Simon. Appreciate it very much. <laughs>